Hi, Paul Beck with uh, BAC, University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. Uh, hopefully um, you don't see me with too many of these um, cigars. I, I've taken to smoking uh, black licorice cigars uh, just because of the, uh, the, the stress from our, our changing climate. You know, we all have our, our foibles and, and weaknesses. So this is my website. And I'm going to, you know, Clivar came up with a very interesting report. Okay, and uh, it, Arctic change and its influences on mid-latitude climate and weather. There was a conference. Um, there were over 100 experts at the conference. You can download the white paper report in PDF format. And that's what I'm talking about here. So here we go. Okay, so let me uh, just click here. Arctic change and possible, that should take out the possible. Influence on mid-latitude climate and weather. Okay, March 2018. So let's, write, let's get right into the report here. Okay, so the Arctic has warmed more than twice as fast. Now, I've been saying for years that the Arctic warming is... Uh, five to eight times faster than the global average. That's high in the Arctic, depends on how far north you go. But since, if you define the Arctic as north of 60 degrees, I think they do that here, since the mid 20th century, remember that this would be 1950s, right? From 1900 on, we start the 20th century, right? Some, pe uh, some people, I still get a bit confused of that sometimes. I have to work back and say, well, zero to 999, zero to 99, that's the first century, right? So the second one is 100 to, you know, 199. And so it, we're, so this is 1950s. We've had Arctic amplification where the Arctic is warm more than twice as fast as the global average. If you look at the warming, I think since between 1984 or something and 2014, it's that number is six times. Okay, I'll, I'll get to that in the details of the report. But there, these are profound changes to the Arctic system. So now a period of ostensibly, why would you use that word? They use that word because it looks like it's related to, but it may not be. Um, period. So it looks like there's ostensibly more frequent events. Well, there are more frequent events. The statistics of weather has changed. I'm not sure why that word... Uh, that word means that, uh, you know, it may or may not have happened. Frequent events of extreme weather across the northern hemisphere, mid-latitudes. And we know that the extreme weather events are actually around the globe. Okay, it's, it's in the southern hemisphere too. And, you know, it's interesting that they don't, they don't even talk about that at all. Or at least, I, you know, I haven't read the entire report yet. Um, but, you know, I'm halfway through and it hasn't been mentioned. So that means extreme heat and rainfall events, recent severe weather, severe winters. Winter temperatures have generally warmed since 1960 over mid to high latitudes, right? The acceleration in the rate of warming at high latitudes relative to the west of the Northern Hemisphere started in 1990. And trends since 1990 show cooling over the Northern Hemisphere continent, at least the Eastern North America, and over parts of Asia. And, you know, this is, this is climate change going on. It's a, the, the distribution of heat at different times of the year changes on the planet. In general, we're hitting record warming globally, but there's still regional differences. Okay, so it says the, the link between, the possible link between Arctic change and mid-latitude climate and weather spurred a rush of new observational and modeling studies. Okay, most of, we don't have a lot of good data in the Arctic. The Arctic is a cold, remote place. Scientists go up into the Arctic to study it for short periods of time, and they only cover, they only measure stuff within a small region. Um, that's important. Those studies in situ um, studies are, are very important for ground truthing satellite data. But we have a dearth of data in the Arctic. Okay, so in order to understand these linkages, 
We need to get more observations because relying on the models can be very problematic, especially when the models don't properly predict the decline of sea ice rate. So, so there was uh, this was an, there was an international workshop at Georgetown University in Washington D.C. February first to third of last year, twenty seventeen. Experts in the fields of atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere sciences assembled. More than 100 participants, the largest and most comprehensive gathering to address this topic. Okay, I, I have, they must have forgotten, maybe my invitation got lost in the, in cyberspace or something. Not, I never, you know, not sure why I never heard about that one. Maybe I'm person non grata because of, I've been talking about what they've been discovering. I've been talking about it for, you know, eight years or so since 20, 2010, and it looks a bit embarrassing, um, you know, that uh, so, you know, the, the experts, a hundred of them have to convene to come out with stuff that I've been saying basically for eight years, giving it a little bit of plug-in. So some of the workshop findings. Okay, there's rapid Arctic change. There's an emergence of new forcing of atmospheric circulations. Okay, uh, rapid Arctic change is evident in the observations and is simulated and projected by global climate models. So but the models do agree that there should be Arctic amplification. We're talking about temperature. And that's been attributed to sea ice, Arctic sea ice, and also to snow decline. Okay, now this, it's interesting. This paper only talks about the ice decline, really. It doesn't talk about the snow decline. Ice is declining uh, about, I think it was 13.3% per, per decade. Um, snow decline in the spring is, is double, almost double, it's 22% per decade plus, right? And it, it, it has a, a, a big, as big a forcing on the Arctic as the sea ice, but everybody focuses on the sea ice. Um, however, this cannot explain why Arctic amplification is greatest in the winter and weakest in the summer. Okay, there's other factors like increased downwelling of long wave radiation from greenhouse gases. Okay, so as we get more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, including water vapor concentrations from both local sources, evaporation of the recently exposed Arctic Ocean water, and that water vapor goes up into the atmosphere as a gas, and then it can condense into droplets or ice crystals and form clouds, etc. But it's a greenhouse gas, powerful. Um, so the shortwave radiation is the radiation from the sun, heats up the earth. Heat is basically long wave radiation, and that heat is trapped by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Okay, and so it'll heat up the clouds and then it'll be back down, down well back to the surface, and um, that will take out some sea ice. Um, the oceans are getting warmer, right, due to local and remote processes. So locally, as there's less and less sea ice in the Arctic, the water heats up because the water is dark and uh, that gives local heating. There's also ocean currents that are bringing warm water. So remote processes, uh, warm water from lower latitudes bringing heat into the Arctic. Regional and hemispheric atmospheric circulation changes. So we can talk about these planetary waves, these global waves jet streams, Rossby waves of atmospheric global circulation. We can also talk about hemispheric differences in the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. We can also talk about regional, uh, regional effects. Um, increased poleward heat transport in the atmosphere and ocean. Okay, the equator is hot, the Arctic is cold. About two thirds of the heat goes, that goes from the equator to the Arctic is in the atmosphere, about a third is in the oceans. But now the Arctic is warming by itself because the short wave, because it's a lot darker, short wave radiation is uh, being absorbed in the darker surfaces, heating the Arctic up from those regions. But that's only in the summer when the sun is out. The sun's up 24 hours in the summer. Of course, uh, most you know in the winter it's completely dark there, and then all the most of the effects are from um, remote processes, transport of heat and moisture into the Arctic. And of course, the, the nature of clouds is changing. More water vapor in the atmosphere, more condensation, and in the Arctic case, when it's cold, ice crystals forming, more clouds forming, and that changes the radiation balance, the energy balance. Okay, in particular, 
there is emerging emotion, um, emotional, uh, emerging observational evidence that an enhanced poleward transport of sensible and latent heat. Okay, these are important terms. Sensible heat is something that causes the temperature to rise. Okay, so if you have water, you put it on the stove, the Bunsen burner or the natural gas flame transfers energy to the pot, heats up the water, increases the temperature. That's the sensible heat increasing. Higher water temperature, the molecules are moving faster. More of them are likely to escape in, out of the liquid into the atmosphere. Okay, and when you get boiling, you get a continuous process of release of, of the uh, water vapor. Uh, latent heat is stored heat, okay? If you have ice in a ice on the Arctic Ocean and you put in heat, it, the ice melts, the temperature is, at the surface is still about zero, the melting point, or minus 1.8 in the case of seawater melting, if there's a lot of, a lot of brine pockets um, in, the, in the ice. Um, but generally, I mean, the freezing point of seawater at, at nominal salinity, average salinity of the ocean is minus 1.8 Celsius. Okay, so latent heat, when you, it's stored heat. So when you have water vapor that rises up and moves, when you have moisture that is transported, that moisture, because it's a water, because it's a water in a vapor form, in a gas form, the molecules are moving fast and they have heat. And when they condense into, into liquid and slow down or can slow down even more into ice, then that heat is released, that latent heat is released. This is why we get these massive storms. Um, you get this latent heat release from the water vapor that convex upwards. Hot air rises, convex upwards, the air contains laden with water vapor. Water vapor condenses, releases energy, fuels these big storms. Okay, so this is changes in the atmospheric circulation, the jet streams that cause more poleward transport of sensible and latent heat and also moisture. Okay, and also when we get the jet stream broken and wavy, this, it, this, this report is talking mostly about heat transported to the Arctic and moisture transported to the Arctic. But the key factor also is some, it has to displace air that's in the Arctic. The air in the Arctic has to go southward and that air is very cold and very dry. Okay, so if you have cold air moving southward, that reflects, that's a huge warming of the Arctic. You know, it's not as obvious as when you have hot air moving into the Arctic, of course that heats, but cold air leaving um, also heats. So the Arctic to mid-latitude linkages, okay? There's strong linkages. We're getting screwed up weather at mid-latitude, but it's not happening just in the Northern Hemisphere, So, which is what this report is focusing on. I think they should have a more general mandate. They should have chapters at least discuss um, the other things in, that are in the picture, and they don't. So the topic is controversial and vigorously debated at the workshop. And see, there's a lot of scientists that are holdouts and saying that, well, no, it's not the Arctic and, you know, the traditionalists, the uh, stuck, you know, stuck in, in academia, the ivory tower sort of view, not seeing what's happening out your window sort of thing. I'm not sure why it's still controversial and vigorously debated. But anyway, they concluded, they came to the right conclusion. Um, that I've been saying for eight years, a rapid Arctic change is contributing to changes in mid-latitude climate and weather, as well as the occurrence, increasing occurrence of extreme weather events becoming, they're actually extreme weather events, not occurrence. Yeah, they're, they're, they're happening, if the frequency of them is increasing. There's more and more of them. The intensity of them, they're much more severe and the duration, they're much longer, like ra torrential rainfall lasting for days, causing flooding or, 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 or droughts, long-term droughts, drying up things, um, you know, messing up the soils, et cetera, you know, parching regions. But how significant um, is less understood. So based on what you do is you do a synthesis effort. You take observational and modeling studies. The modeling studies, observations always win. Okay, there's not enough of them in the Arctic. There's a dearth of them. So there's a whole bunch of physical processes that are list from high to low confidence. Um, and I'm running out of time in this video. And I got to page uh, 
what, whatever, I'm not very far in. But anyway, I'm gonna, this whole series of videos is trying to explain in detail what's going on. Thank you.